Hi, good afternoon. I'd like to call to order and I'd like to read the accessibility statement, which is Title VI. It's the Notice of Protection in Introductions. This meeting is accessible to people with disabilities. Microphones or telephones will be used by all speakers. Lodge, print materials are available upon advance request. If you would like either of these accommodations, please contact Mary Waldron at 508-583-583. One eight three three. The notice of non-discrimination rights and protections to beneficiaries with regard to the federal <clears throat> Title VI slash non-discrimination protections and the state non-discrimination protections is posted in this meeting room and is available on the Oak Colony Planning Council website. Please contact Mary Waldron at 508-583-1833 for more information. And thank you, and I welcome everyone. I just want to call to order and um, move on to, do you want to do um, a roll call now? I'll wait till we've, we vote, Bill. I think we were one of the moment of silence. Oh, yes. Uh, moment of silence, and I don't know if all you folks remember, but Dan Crane was the executive director for OCPC for 32 years. and. Mm -hmm. I was um, on a lot of committees that uh, that Dan shared, and he was the ultimate professional, uh, excellent executive director, and really moved, I think, the council forward in all his initiatives, and he was very innovative, and um, staff was wonderful, and he was just a, a wonderful power of example, and I think it's, it's sad. He'll be missed. He'll be missed, and I have to say, and also a great planner. I really appreciated his planning skills. Uh, if anyone would like to add anything at this time. Yeah, thanks, Noreen. Um, so Dan was the second executive director of OCPC and he worked here for 32 years. Oh. But importantly, even after his retirement, he remained active as a planner. He was a town planner in Abington and was a private consultant. Um, Dan earlier on had, um, served in the army and he was a graduate of Villanova, a degree in economics. And then he went on to Harvard and got a degree in uh, city and urban planning. And, you know, as you said, you know, he, he was a great colleague and mentor, you know, here at the council, who was a friend and, a, you know, sometimes a father figure to, to lead interns into the planning profession and set them on their path to success. And, you know, we as a staff are, forever grateful for all his contributions over the years and you know he'll be forever in our memories and one of the things we're looking to do is rename one of the areas in our building after dan as a like a dan crane memorial hall so nice great um anyone else like to add anything about dan all right if we just could have a moment of silence for dan He will certainly be missed. Uh, thank you all for attending the meeting today. And I'm gonna go on to item number two, which is public comments. Um, are there any comments from any of the uh, members today? Hearing none, I'm gonna move on to item number three, which is minutes <coughs> of the June 6th, 2024 meeting. I'll make that motion, Dan from Whitman. Uh, who would second that motion? Second is from Hanson. Okay, Don is seconding that motion. Uh, roll call, please, Bill. Sure. Abington? Yes. Thank you. Avon? Yes. Bridgewater? Brockton? Yes. Thank you. Duxbury? East Bridgewater? Eastern? <clears throat> Halifax, Hanover, 
Hanson? Yes. Thank you. Kingston? Pembroke? Yes. Ten. Stoughton? West Bridgewater? Whitman? Yes. Yes, present. Martinier Transit? I believe Michael's actually waiting to be promoted to panelist. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're actually having some uh, difficulties with Zoom. I can see that there are attendees um, to promote, but I can't see anybody's names. Um, so if you're able to um, vote on his behalf or if he's able to join you, um, that would be much yes. appreciated while we try to uh, resolve this issue. Dr. Ari Transit is yes. Gotcha. Yes. Mass Dot District Five. Yes. And Mass Dot Office of Transportation Planning. Okay. Also, Madam Chair. And Shane Shane O'Brien is here. Also, okay. he just he just sent a message. All right. Thank you, Bill. I'm going to move on to communications, and that would be Sean. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, getting uh, Starting off with the communications for this month is uh, charging and fueling infrastructure discret discretionary grant uh, deadline extended. The purpose of this uh, notice of funding opportunity is to solicit applications for the charging and fueling infrastructure discretionary grant program. Um, funds under the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Formula Program, 10% set aside, um, will be awarded under this uh, NOFO. The new application deadline is September 11th, 2024. Uh, the next item is Reconnecting Communities Pilot Program. Uh, started by USDOT, they are requesting applications for uh, re Reconnecting Communities Pilot discretionary grant programs through this notice of funding opportunity. Uh, the application deadline is September 30th. Uh, this program aims to advance and support reconnection of communities divided by transportation infrastructure with a priority on helping disadvantaged communities improve access to daily needs such as jobs, schools, health care, grocery stores, and recreation. Uh, for more information, please click on the hyperlink in the staff report. Uh, the next item is a USDOT public engagement workshop. It will be held Monday, September 9th, this upcoming Monday at 4 p.m. Uh, the USDOT's Office of the Secretary's Office of Public Engagement is holding this virtual public involvement workshop, building on in-person workshops delivered across the country. Uh, this workshop will engage community leaders and members of the public on transportation decision-making process and how they can ensure that their voices are heard. Uh, for more information and to register for this webinar, you can click on the hyperlink in the staff report. Uh, the next item is a Massachusetts Safe Routes to School, Signs and Lines, and Infrastructure Grant Program. Uh, both application periods will open on Wednesday, September 4th uh, for both the Signs and Lines as well as Infrastructure Grant Program uh, to register for these webinars. Um, and for more information, you can click on the hyperlinks in this staff report. The next item is IWALK, International Walk, Bike, and Roll to School Day. Uh, this event is typically held the first Wednesday of October. This year, it will be held on Wednesday, October 9th from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Students and families across Massachusetts will walk, bike, and roll to school to enjoy a, self, a safe, healthy, and active lifestyle. For more information, please click on the hyperlink in the staff report. The next item is a Federal Funds and Infrastructure Office, uh, which is the lead agency within the Healy Driscoll administration, tasked with implementing a whole of government approach to ensuring the Commonwealth of Massachusetts can leverage the historic opportunities available for federal funding. The next Federal Funds Partnership meeting will be held September 24th at 2 p.m. Uh, to register for the Zoom meeting, please click on the hyperlink in the staff report. The next item is uh, MassDOT announces application schedule for community transit program. Uh, for fiscal year 2025, the following application schedules uh, apply 
uh, the application period for operating and mobility management grants will be open September 26th and close on November 1st. The application period for the Accessible Vehicles Grant will open on October 15th and close on November 22nd. Uh, for more information on the Community Transit Grant Program, please visit the hyperlink in the staff report. And that is communications. Thank you, Sean. Are there any questions for Sean from the committee? Thanks again. I'm going to move on uh, to number five, which are reports. And the first one is the Brockton Area Regional Transit Authority batch. And that would be Michael. Thank you, Chair. Um, <laughs> and thank you for promoting me, Sean. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so three updates um, today. First, as usual, we'll start with ridership. We're continuing to see uh, recent history record ridership on the heels of our fair, fair free program and service improvements. Uh, we provided 330,000 fixed route trips in August, which is um, at least a 20 year high and um, completed over 14,000 trips two days ago. Um, uh, which is a, a great uh, new high for us. Second, uh, we are um, starting this Saturday, providing um, new Saturday service on our Rockland microtransit. So feel free to spread the word on that. We had been running Monday through Friday previously, uh, but the success of that program has prompted us along with a grant received from MassDOT to expand that service. And third, um, we don't have a firm date yet, but we're targeting mid-October for our um, a, a multi-element uh, event, which would be the ribbon cutting for our battery electric buses, celebration of our 50-year anniversary, and a customer appreciation day, uh, which we hold every year. Um, so stay tuned for that. Save the date. And that is all I have at this time, unless there's any questions. Um, I I didn't hear what you said. You said 330,000 trips. And what was that period? In August. That in one month? In one month. Whoa, 330,000 <laughs> trips? That is, it's double what we were doing. Wow. Uh, at this time last year. Oh, that's um, awesome. That is awesome. Great numbers. Um, anyone have any comments or anything to add or any questions for Mike? I see hands, but I don't know who they belong to. Are those questions, Sean? Uh, that's no, a the, pause. Yes. No, they are. That's a pause, no, it, yeah. Yeah, it was people applauding, uh, applauding the good news. Oh, okay, okay. I wasn't sure. That's great. All right. Thank you. Um, number uh, 5B, which is the Greater Attleboro Taunton Regional Transit Authority GATRA, and that would be Mary Ellen. I know Mary Ellen's with oh, us. We heard her. Can you hear me? Yeah, there you go. Okay. I knew you were there somewhere. Yeah. The the mute unmute doesn't always seem to like me. <laughs> uh, congratulations yeah. to Mike on those impressive numbers. Uh, I wish we would also see increases that high, but we are continuing to see steady growth in our ridership. Um, and we are starting to struggle with some capacity issues as a result. So for us, uh, growth is going to need uh, some more vehicles, which we are working on getting. Um, we're currently assessing what we have and how we can redistribute some of the new vehicles coming in, but also look at um, if we have bigger vehicles that are in the wrong place, how can we switch things around? Uh, so that is what we are struggling with right now. We are looking to expand our hours on our fixed route and some of our um, demand response uh, microtransit service starting October 1st. Um, it is still a struggle to find drivers, but um, we have brought on some more drivers in the past month. So we will be doing some increases on some routes. And as we can get more staff, we will increase on the rest of our routes. And that is the update from Gatra. 
Thank you, Mary Ellen. Sounds uh, sounds like you're pretty darn busy there. Um, anyone have any questions or something to add at this time? Hearing none, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to item 5C, which is the South Coast Rail Project. Um, that would be Sean. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as we all know, uh, well know by this point, South Coast Rail will be restoring commuter rail service to the cities of Taunton, Fall River, and New Bedford, as they are the only major cities within 50 miles of Boston uh, that currently do not have commuter rail service. Uh, phase one will be providing a one-seat ride uh, to Boston from the South Coast uh, by extending the existing Middleborough Lakeville line. Um, and from the months of June to August, some of the work that uh, was conducted uh, was finishing the fencing installation in the four communities, uh, doing some train testing to and from uh, the southern communities of this extension, Middleborough, East Taunton, Freetown, Fall River, and New Bedford, um, with speeds of up to 79 miles per hour, um, as well as uh, striping and curb and sidewalk work um, throughout multiple communities, uh, daytime trim tree and vegetation trimming, uh, the continued construction of the pedestrian bridge over Route 18 in New Bedford, um, and utility work along Industrial Drive, uh, which will is the road uh, taken to the East Taunton station. Um, if anybody's interested in signing up for these automatic uh, weekly emails, you can click on the hyperlink and enter in your email address. And that is South Coast Rail. Thank you, Sean. Um, any comments or questions for Sean regarding South Coast Rail? All right, hearing none, I'm gonna go to item six, which is old business. It's the FFY 2024 to 2028 Transportation Improvement Program TIP Implementation. Bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I just have a few updates on um, the um, the current FF, FFY 2024 to 2028 TIP. Um, I'll just focus on this current uh, element year 2024. So in staff report where you see the um, the blue highlighting that's a uh, recent um, recent project change uh, with that project. So the first first of which uh, is the um, in Brockton the intersection projects at Center Center Street, which is Route One Twenty Three Carey Street and Lyman Street. Um, last month, uh, third resubmission of PS and E was received, and that's under review. And uh, but that project is still expected to be advertised this year and still in good shape. Uh, the next one, uh, I think we're all, all, all familiar with this one. Uh, also in Brockton, uh, Center Street at Plymouth Street, that project uh, was moved out of 2024 and is um, now programmed in 2025 for the uh, 2025 to 2029 tip, which will go active uh, in October. And lastly, uh, the uh, in Plimpton, the reconstruction project for the or the replacement of the Winnetuxic uh, River, Winnetuxic Road Bridge over the Winnetuxic River, uh, that project went out for bid last month, and uh, so that is moving forward. And with that, that's the um, the updates for projects in 2024. There haven't been any substantial changes to any. Um, any of the pro existing projects in 2025 through 2028. Right. Thank you, Bill. Um, any comments or questions for Bill on the uh, the TIP program, the implementation? All righty, hearing none. Thanks so much, Bill. We're gonna Thank move you. on to seven, which is new business. The Stoughton R Route 139 corridor study and presentation and discussion findings. Madam Chair, it will be me. Broken knee, yeah, okay, there you go. Next, please. Next. Um, so I'm very happy to uh, provide a very high level review for um, Route 139 corridor study on behalf of our project team. Um, so. Route 139 corridor study was enabled under uh, UPWP number 3400. Um, so during the study, uh, we have um, completed a general survey and completed 
data collection, traffic analysis, including capacity safety analysis. Uh, we also work with the town, a very great team. Um, also, we work with MassDOT District 5 for uh, various meetings. We hold a hybrid public meeting on the July 18th. Uh, was a very good outcome. Um, so in the meeting, I'm going to go over the findings and recommendations uh, to the intersection and corridor white. Next, please. So the corridor is about uh, 3.4 miles, centerline mile uh, between Route 27 uh, from the central uh, Stoughton uh, to northern uh, and uh, town line. Uh, it's bordering with uh, uh, Randolph. The corridor um, itself um, has a majority under local jurisdiction and a uh, few um, uh, un under a mile under uh, state jurisdiction. The corridor is classified as a principal arterial in uh, state and state uh, class classification as a principal arterial road. Next, please. Uh, so this is the just overview for our uh, corridor studies uh, survey that we have uh, used it, uh, translated to a few other languages uh, determined um, by the GIS data uh, provided by uh, MassDOT. For language was translated um, in order for um, minor uh, language uh, to, to be understand. Overall, we have 150 responses for the process. Next. Um, so from the result, I'll, I just gave a couple of highlights uh, you know, from the traveler's uh, perspective. Um, so basically the corridor is travel, you know, dominantly with vehicles. Uh, only a few other uh, options were provided along the corridor. As you can see, um, vehicle is a dominant as a major transportation mode. It's over uh, 95%. Next, please. So when we ask about um, the corridor condition, um, over 70% responders answer um, there is a congestion issues. Next, please. So in terms of the safety, uh, over 60% traveler feel this is unsafe uh, corridor. Next, please. So uh, another question was asked is, if other transportation mode will be provided, uh, what would you prefer? Looks like um, walking, it's a very popular um, mode of transportation, which is um, the network is there, but it was not connected, especially for the sidewalks. Next. Um, so this corridor study has been built on uh, several initiatives studies um, that OCPC has been, uh, has been done in the past. Um, since 2010, there was a corridor study uh, in between that time and now we also have a couple um, road safety audit. Um, the, this corridor was also identified as a high priority corridor in 2022. Um, we also had a um, road safety audit for just a pedestrian safety and mobility in, at Low Avenue. Um, so this is where we are and this is more like an inc inclusive, uh, comprehensive and in-depth corridor study. Next. Just a little overview for the corridor. Um, the traffic volume along the corridor, um, it's varied. Um, you know, the lowest could be just over 5,000 to almost 20,000 closer to the interchange area. Um, for the bicycle use, uh, it's about one to eight at the uh, major intersection at peak hour. So that's not a lot of bicycle activity, um, but I would just want to point out uh, at some of the location, the pedestrian use is really high, especially at the um, Pleasant Street and Washington Street. So it's about 100, it's over 120 pedestrians at the peak hours. Uh, in terms of the speed, uh, we have heard a lot, lot of feedback on the unsafe speed issues along the corridor. Um, it really varies from 35 mile per hour to 45 mile per hour. Um, if you can see here, it's really alarming that the, the heavy vehicle range from you know low uh, higher 4% to 24%. Uh, 
this is uh, the methodology and the, the resource that we use for the study. And um, there was uh, um, 23 locations that we have done uh, the ATR data collection. Uh, the ATR is it's, uh, data for volume, speed, and classification, as you see earlier. Um, 10 locations were studied more thoroughly um, in terms of the capacity, for example, uh, what the level of service is, the delay, and also the crash uh, analysis. We also have uh, completed a couple location with a uh, crash diagram. It will be included in the draft report. Uh, we also use um, some of data uh, database provided by MassDOT. Um, In-house, we have done uh, traffic uh, modeling, simulation, and capacity analysis. Uh, I want to point out that uh, we also did a few, uh, few audit, uh, drive-through, walk-through survey uh, with the town. It was very productive, so it helps us to identify uh, the safety concerns and capacity concerns. Next, please. Um, just a couple highlights for the major intersection. The first one is at the Lincoln Street. Um, this is a uh, top 200 uh, crash location for the state. And uh, we received uh, really good feedback from the um, residents at the hybrid meeting. And this location, you know, the geometric and the design of the location was unsafe. Um, we also identified a couple um, side distance issue. Uh, the town is working really hard, uh, very proactive at this location couple improvement has been done in the past and now they're working with a consultant on further improvement. The potential improvement will include traffic signal or roundabout, but none of them will be happening uh, without a traffic study. I think the town is working on that with the consultant at this point. Next. So this location is north to Lincoln. Um, uh, the town is working with a consultant as well on the traffic signal update, and they plan to move uh, the loop detector locations and uh, also improve the bike and path safeties at this location. Next, please. Um, this, uh, this location at Pine Street, um, we IC, OCPC has done a, a road safety at this location as well. Um, so uh, the town is working with a consultant with for the redesign of the uh, intersection. Uh, I can show you one of the uh, the concept plan the town provide us. Next, please. So the, the curb uh, radius has been tightened a little bit closer to a formalized intersection. Uh, pavement marking is, uh, is planned to provide it, uh, providing a exclusive left and right turn lane from um, Route 139. Next. Okay, so for, for some reason, the the, um, the, photo, the picture is not showing the location, but um, this location, it's uh, also under uh, state project. It's under 75% design. Um, basically, um, it, it's, it's a, I think it has been a while. This, the, um, this location has some uh, settlement issue. This is a part of the three R project, uh, as well as the road realignment. Um, next, please. So this is just uh, some information uh, from the uh, state project website, in including the cost and the uh, description of the project. Next, please. So this location, it's at the um, target entrance. Also, uh, this uh, gas station uh, to the uh, west side. Um, as we have been uh, conducting a couple field survey, we've, we felt strongly felt this location is not safe, not only for uh, vehicles, but also pedestrians. Um, some of the uh, recommendation we provide is to improve the geometric, geometric design and also apply access management uh, design techniques. Uh, for example, some of the uh, conflicting movement could be reduced uh, by also considering and consolidating uh, some of the driveway 
um, provide a raised median in the middle. Uh, as you can see from the photo, um, there is a, a curvature issue, not only horizontal, but also vertically. And especially in the uh, adverse uh, weather condition, uh, when roads get slippery, um, you know, it, it aggravated with the speeding issues. It is definitely um, a location that worth looking into it for improvement. Okay, next please. So this is the uh, last major intersection along a corridor. Um, this project, I have been told this location um, will be improved. Um, we do not have any further details. Um, at the meantime, we uh, conducted a few visit at this location with the town. Um, so uh, this location had a couple issues, you know, not only the geometric, but also the signal uh, infrastructure, um, the obsolete traffic signal, some of the pavement marking I can see obviously on the, on the photo is uh, um, the pavement condition as well. So we will include all the proposed recommendations uh, for consideration in the draft report. So um, this is just uh, overall uh, strategy for improvement. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, all will be included in the draft report. So in terms of intersections, um, we look into any um, possibility of helping um, reduce the delay and improve the traffic safety for vehicle, uh, vehicles, uh, pedestrians, and bicyclists. Um, some of the, uh, the roadway has a really wide radius, um, no protection of uh, cro uh, pedestrian crossing. I think those are the you know, uh, recommendation we'll provide. Um, there is some area along the corridor does not have a, a speed, uh, speed limit regulation. There's something we'll work with the state and the town, you know, look for the uh, solutions as part of the uh, result of this corridor study. Um, in terms of bicycle walking safety, what we heard from um, the conversation with the town um, uh, residents, they really want to see a good uh, network for walking. Uh, we have done a survey along the corridor. We identify those uh, discontinuity of uh, sidewalks. Um, so we will provide that in the draft report and provide the uh, recommendation, not only the location, but also the general dimensions for those uh, facilities for consideration. And we will also provide this report to our transit agency, um, any partners, you know, that could help providing any other transportation modes rather than, you know, via uh, automobile transportations. Next, please. Um, like I said uh, a couple of times, our next step, we're very happy to, uh, to see the project uh, at the, this point. We're able to send out the draft report very shortly, and we plan to uh, publish the final report uh, by the end of September. Uh, we also have a website that have all the detailed information uh, with this uh, corridor study process and results. Next, please. Uh, I would be happy to answer any questions. Just want to say thank uh, Ray and our project project study team uh, for this wonderful uh, uh, project. Okay. Thank you so much. I um I had a question. Uh, you mentioned earlier in your presentation mm -hmm. that um, the speed limit was thirty five to forty five miles per hour. Did you find that consistently throughout the whole route, the um, 3.4 miles, or was some areas faster than other areas or slower than other areas? I'm thinking mm -hmm. as far as safety, if you know, if you had crosswalks there and you were adding maybe additional crosswalks mm -hmm. uh, as far as safety. 
I guess I was thinking more pedestrian safety. That that's a great question, uh, Noreen. So the the speed limit uh, along Route One Thirty Nine, I believe it's uh, different throughout the corridor. In the okay. more dense area in the south, um, uh -huh. it's lower than the north. Um, um, in terms of the speeding, it is identified as a top uh, issue for the corridor. Even though we are looking at the forty-five mile, might not be really high speed in some mm -hmm. of the area. You don't have a lot of driveways access. But um, when we were out there, especially at the uh, um, horseway, uh, it's the uh, uh, target entrance, you can really feel there's no way pedestrian can cross the street safely. Mm -hmm. So it's it's the context of the right. corridor. There's a lot of residential, um, you know, developed area, uh, commercial. So speeding is one of the top priority for this corridor that we need to you know look for improvement either using engineering design. Um, I talk, I probably did not point it out the traffic calming strategy. It's um, some of the location could use, consider roundabout, um, reducing the lane width, because uh, enforcement can only do well if there's a good engineering design. So traffic mm -hmm. coming will be brought into the conversation. Also, uh, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll provide the recommendation, you know, for reducing the speed. And you also mentioned signage. Maybe there wasn't enough signage of what particular area, what the speed limit was. You had mentioned that earlier. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So that I think that's important too. Yeah, the signage also is one of our recommendations and make mm -hmm. sure um, when there's a regulation, we have signs uh, according associated to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments? Great presentation. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, um, Madam Chair, that uh, what Ho Jong said in, is is the context of, of the uh, corridor. So from Turnpike Street North, it's mostly under um, state jurisdiction, mm -hmm. and it opens up from a, a two-lane cross section to a four-lane cross section, and it's more commercial, uh, industrial use up that mm -hmm. way. So the the four lanes makes a big difference because now it opens up and people can drive faster. But south sure. of that, south of that is two lanes, and as as Kuo Jung said. It's residential, so it's kind of like the context of it. E even though the residential is only two lanes, uh, you know, south under the uh, local jurisdiction, the speeds are actually high because people use use um, use it as a cut through, or they use Lincoln Street as a cut through, and that's where the intersection of Lincoln Street and um, Pleasant Street Route One Thirty Nine has become problematic because it's it's such a cut through there. And in our survey, the people in the in the, in the town of Stoughton. They said that that is the worst intersection, practically, you know, in the town. They they really want to focus on that intersection. But I just wanted to add that with Po Chong actually did say context, but it's the the speed is like the context of the corridor. It kind of mm -hmm. changes the character as you go towards Route Twenty Four and the and the um, right uh, the the ramps. Mm -hmm. And what about the uh, the heavy vehicles? Um. That's quite a high percentage if it goes up to the twenty five percent on that route. Yeah, it. We did the uh, replica survey um, for uh, like the origin and destination of vehicles on nice. on there, and actually, uh, it's it's very heavily that that interchange there is used heavily by businesses in Stoughton in the industrial area. So that's why the the, the trucks did access to Route twenty four. Right. And the, the the data was broken up by county. So uh, that county, I think it's Norfolk County, was heavily, it's like 75%. I can't remember the exact number, but the most of the people that use that interchange to Route 24 are actually local. Um, I was surprised because there, there's not a lot of people coming from other parts of, there are people from other parts of New England uh, and actually other parts of the country, but it's like heavily used by the by the local businesses local. And, the, and the local people for commuting. So, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Noreen, if I may answer, like the heavy vehicle mm -hmm. percentage question, so we cannot stop the um 
the heavy vehicle traveling along Route 139. Um, the number, uh, you know, I'm sorry, the numbers may be misleading because um, the truck percentage to the south is actually lower than the north, uh, especially the Turnpike Page Street area. A lot of uh, warehouse, commercial, um, you know, some industrial was a little bit high. Um, for the heavy vehicle percentage um, okay. you know in terms of design uh, you know if the roadway has a appropriate uh, adequate radius uh, you can see you know the it is a concern but you cannot stop you know <laughs> heavy vehicle right. on the road and um, some of the deterioration issues for the roadway you know it's the kind of things that probably reduce the life cycle of the roadway conditions so this is part of mm -hmm. that we are living in right thank you sure. Thanks. Well, any questions from the uh, committee or comments? Um, I would speak up. Um, okay. Rick Jordan, um, I, you started your presentation talking about the congestion problem on Route 139, but then you've repeatedly offered to make it a more complex uh, situation at many of these uh, intersections with bicycle lanes and uh, greater sidewalk traffic. I realize we have to do that to some extent, but it seems to me there's an inherent contradiction there between trying to reduce or deal with congestion in a safe manner and then throwing bicycles in there as well. I mean, personally, as a recreational biker, I would almost never want to bike anywhere along that stretch of 139. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I may answer the question, I think uh, so. Our transportation system, it's just like a fist pie, right? Um, so capacity and safety sometimes are compromised with each other. If you provide a bicycle and pedestrian facility, you might slow down um, the the vehicle traffic going through the uh, intersection. For example, if you have all uh, pedestrian um, traffic like a, a crossing, you might slow down you. You may have a more a red light, red time uh, for the vehicles. But I, I like your question because some of the uh, solution for improving bike and path safety is exclusive, like separate lane, separate, separate bike, bike lane, uh, or wide sidewalk. They don't have to mix with the uh, the traffic. I agree with you. Driving on uh, um, a forty five mile per hour road, you don't really want to see a bicycle next to you right so we will provide some of the recommendation for uh sidewalk that's not you know mixed with the traffic so yeah I, I i'd also yeah, i'd I also like to but I'd, I'd also like to add that, the details of each intersection and what exactly yeah. was proposed at each intersection yeah because it's and i just like to add like context again um, you know, we had a lot of conversation with the town of, of Stoughton. So if you if you look at Turnpike Street South, the, the, the context is different, is more residential. Once you get past Turnpike Street and Pleasant Street, I agree 100 percent that uh, pedestrians and bicyclists is very dangerous. In fact, the two fatalities, one was a jogger up in that area near, near the um, uh, near, near the Turnpike, uh, near the uh, Route 24 uh, ramps and the other was not a bicyclist but a moped which is similar um, but if, if if you go south from turnpike street there's a lot of pedestrian because it's residential and there's a lot of connections missing and that's what the town wanted to focus on those missing connections uh along route 139 along pleasant street which is mostly residential south of turnpike street in the two lane section and that's when when we say you know sidewalks, that's where the improvements are needed for bicyclists and pedestrians in that two lane section, because it's more residential and it's, it, it, people still speed, you know, because they're trying to cut through, but it's it, it's more compatible um, with, with bicycling and walking. But up in that other area where it's, where it's four lanes and heavy traffic, you know, absolutely, you know, what you said is true. Thank you all. Uh, any other questions or comments? Thanks again. Um, great presentation. Lots of information for all of us. I'm going to move on, if we're finished with this, to 7B, which is the Old Colony 2023 Commuter Origin Study, and the presentation of final report, and that would be Sean.
Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, mm -hmm. I am the manager of our congestion management process, uh, which part of it uh, includes uh, doing a commuter origin study every four years. Uh, the last study that we did was back in 2019. Um, and now that the 2023 report was completed uh, earlier this uh, this year, either late spring or early summer, um, wanted to present the uh, the final present final report uh, to the JTC. Um, so, as part of the congestion man as part of the congestion management process, OCPC visits uh, 15 commuter rail uh, facilities and five park and ride locations. Uh, one of the 15 commuter rail uh, stations is the Brockton Station here in downtown Brockton, uh, which includes a visit to the uh, Brockton Area Transit parking garage uh, located just to the east of the station. Uh, we conduct this data collection every April and October. Uh, this particular data collection took place in April of 2023. Um, and our data collection when we're not no, under normal uh, data collections in, entails just conducting a utilization count of all the vehicles present in the parking lot. For the commuter origin study, uh, we collect license plates so that we can determine uh, from what community are these vehicles uh, visiting and parking at these stations. And uh, congested facilities are ones that have a utilization rate of 85% or greater. Um, and since the October 2019 count up, up to the April 2023 count, none of the facilities that we have visited have hit the 85% uh, congested threshold. Um, so the purpose of the study, it's a quadrennial project uh, done every four years. Uh, we conduct this project, conduct the study to determine where uh, commuters are originating from uh, at all of our commuter, commuter rail and park and ride facilities. Uh, we achieve this by analyzing the utilization rates uh, twice a year and see how they compare to years past. Uh, we interpret the commuter trip movements, try to figure out, you know, where, where commuters are visiting uh, from each from each location and you know why they might be going to th that location and then determining the trends of each location compared to previous uh, studies. Um, this was the first commuter origin study that we have conducted since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we anticipated lower utilization uh, due to the shift uh, for many jobs to hybrid or remote work, as well as just the changes in commuting patterns uh, that we have seen since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, so the purpose of the congestion management process uh, is a four-step four process. One is to determine the causes of congestion, uh, both recurring and non-recurring. Um, you know, develop alternative strategies to mitigate the congestion. Try to come up with ideas that can help uh, reduce or eliminate you know congestion where you know where possible. Um, evaluate these different mitigation strategies. You know, figure out what strategies worked, which ones did not. Um, work so well. And then lastly, proposed strategies that address the causes of congestion. Um, so as I stated previously, we conduct uh, two data collections um, in the months of April and October during the off-peak hours, uh, which is from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on mid-weekdays, so either Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Uh, one of our formerly visited facilities was the Plymouth commuter rail station, which closed in 2021. Uh, there was a, at one point, there was a uh, report that came out that said that the Plymouth commuter rail station may reopen. Um, I believe that has since been recanted and the station is going to remain closed. Um, almost 3000 license plates were collected um, at all of our visited locations. And we had a matched rate or percentage of 95.7%, which is the highest that we've had um, in the last three studies. And, um, you know, we received the MBTA license plates uh, from the MBTA itself. Um, for anybody who may not know, uh, CommuterL has since started using the pay by phone app for parking where you have to enter in your vehicle information. So obtaining the license plates from the MBTA is a very uh, easy process. Um, there are three commuter rail lines that go into the OCPC region. Uh, the Kingston line, which stretches as far north as the South Weymouth station um, and as far south as the Kingston station. The Middleborough Lakeville line, uh, which the northernmost station we visit is Holbrook Randolph, and the southern end is the Middleborough Lakeville station. And then the Stoughton branch of the Providence Stoughton line of the two Canton stations, as well as the Stoughton station. Uh, for the MBTA commuter rail utilization, 
uh, there were tw 2,317 of the of the just under 3,000 license plates were collected at MBTA uh, commuter rail stations as well as the back garage. Uh, 2,238 of them were matched with a matched percentage of 96.6%. And I'll briefly go through a, a few of these stations. Uh, to, to save on time, I selected one station from each of the line each of the three lines that go into the region. And then for anybody who wishes to see all of the maps, um, I will put the link to the report in the chat um, for anybody to view who wishes so, who wishes to do so. Um, so on the Middleborough Lakeville line, uh, this is the map of the final results of the Bridgewater commuter rail station. Um, and going through the trend data, um, the, 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 the utilization went down slightly from 2015 to 19 and then significantly to 2023. Um, like I said, that was anticipated just with the uh, the shift in commuter trends from or th that have resulted from the pandemic. Um, and then the top five communities, uh, Bridgewater, Raynham and East Bridgewater were the top three in each of the data collections. And then Taunton was also represented um, as well as Meadowboro and Halifax. Um, and the percent matched of license plates was actually 100%. Every single license plate we were provided uh, was able to be matched, uh, something that we have not had happen uh, previously in previous studies. On the Kingston line, uh, here is the results from the Hanson commuter rail station. Um, the utilization of this past data collection was 30% compared to in the 60s from the two previous uh, commuter rail or the commuter origin studies, excuse me. Um, and then for the most represented communities, Pembroke was at the top all three times. Uh, Hanson and Halifax and East Bridgewater uh, shifted in various positions uh, in the last three studies, as well as the town of Duxbury. And then we were able to match 99.2% of the license plates, which as you can see, there was only one that we were unable to uh, get matched with the community where the vehicle was registered. And then lastly, here is the Stoughton uh, commuter rail station. Um, there were 145 vehicles parked here, 44.9% uh, utilization. Um, Stoughton, Easton, and Brockton were the top three most represented communities in each data collection, uh, with various towns taking up the final two spots in the top five communities. And we were able to match 93.8% of these license plates collected at the Stoughton station. And then switching over to the MassDOT park and ride uh, locations. We There are two highway corridors that go through the OCPC region that we visit for their park and ride uh, locations. The Route 3 corridor has the Rockland, Plymouth, and Bourne locations, and then Route 24 has the West Bridgewater and Bridgewater locations. Uh, there were 662 license plates recorded at the park and ride locations, and 614 of them were able to be matched with a, with a matched percentage of 92.7%. And then here is the results of the Plymouth Park and Ride location uh, located at the Long Pond Road exit off of Route 3. Uh, there were 126 vehicles parked here with 63.0% utilization. Uh, Plymouth, no surprises there, was the top represented community each time uh, with other South Shore and Cape Cod communities being uh, seen at this location. And there were only 10 license plates that were not be able, were unable to be matched, and 92.1% of the license plates were able to be matched at this facility. And then going over to Route 24, uh, the West Bridgewater Park and Ride, uh, only two matches, only two license plates were unable to be matched with a 97.6% match rate. Uh, there were 84 vehicles out of 185 spaces, um, and over the last three commuter origin studies that we conducted. Uh, there was a slight shift in the different in the communities that were represented. Uh, Bridgewater was always highly represented, the highest represented the, the last two times. Uh, this time, it was actually the city of Taunton that was most represented. Um, unsure as to why that happened, but that is what the data shows. And here's an overall look at the utilization of all the commuter rail stations on the three lines. Uh, Canton Junction had the highest utilization at 52.8% of all of the commuter rail stations and was actually the only commuter rail station that surpassed 50% uh, utilization. And then here are all the park and ride locations. The highest utilized was the Bourne Park and Ride just uh, right next to the Sagamore Bridge at 65%. And all lots had a 52.5% utilization rate.
And then, uh, so Replica is a tool that we've started to use. Go Chung uh, mentioned a Replica in his presentation on the Route 139 corridor study. And we were able to get data for spring of 2023. Uh, we, we were unable to get the same date or dates that we used uh, for this data collection. Um, the, the leftmost column is the total spaces at each station. The OCPC column is the numbers that we counted. And then the replica is the amount of users that they reported going through, going into each station um, on a on a Thursday in the spring of 2023. Um, as you can see, some were very close, such as Canton Junction. There was only a 9.2% difference. Uh, the I think the next closest was Whitman at 28.2%. Uh, but there were some locations, such as the Holbrook Randolph Station. You know, obviously there was a 314% difference. Um, how how Replica works is we were able to do trip destinations by links. At these locations and the all the locations with the asterisks um, are facilities that have uh, public bus that go through there so it's likely that it also in addition to commuters parking here for the commuter rail it's likely that it also counted uh, bus passengers as well which is you know the difference we believe to be the difference um, in that case and then so in conclusions, um, overall, there was a 52.5% decrease in utilization across all the locations uh, since the last commuter origin study four years ago, uh, with a 43% decrease on the Providence Stoughton line, 60.6% on the Middleborough Lakeville, and 49.5% decrease on the Kingston. Um, obviously, with the COVID, since the beginning of the COVID pandemic, commuter needs have changed uh, since 2019 when we did the last study. Um, at the West Bridgewater Park and park and ride location. Um, it is now serviced by Peter Pan bus service. Uh, I believe it was the Bloom bus service that serviced the location back in 2019. Um, and when Bloom was servicing the station, they had a more commuter need or commuter based schedule. They had all of their pulses in either in the early morning or in the afternoon during the morning and afternoon peak hours. Um, but with the Peter Pan bus service with it being scheduled kind of evenly throughout the day, it doesn't as provide as much of a commuter friendly um, bus service um, as well uh, also would like to point out that the former lot at the silver city galleria in taunton um, they have since closed and on the peter pan as well as i believe the the park and ride website um, they have been directed to park at the west bridgewater park and ride lot um, and one thing i would also like to note is in the last two cmp counts that OCP has conducted since the April 2023 count for the study. Um, utilization rates uh, have seen an increase. Um, just between, um, just in at the October 2023 count, there was a overall 56 and a half percent increase in utilization, um, and we also saw the first congested facilities uh, both times at October 2023 and April of 2024 um, at the Canton Junction station where they saw where that station saw a 92.9 and 90.8% uh, utilization. So something to look forward to uh, in the coming months when we do our next uh, CMP data collection. And that is my presentation uh, for commuter origins. Uh, I see uh, Ray, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that when we use a replica data uh, for usage at a at a station, that replica counts uh, uh, cell phones. So if someone, uh, there's a lot of drop-offs as well as buses. Um, so those those stations that don't have um, that 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 don't have bus service, they also a lot of people go in and they they'll drop someone off, or even sometimes people commute uh, people will carpool. So what replica is counting is cell phones that are going in and out of the station. And what we're counting is our cars that go in and out of the station. So that's probably why you see a lot of disparities, not just because of buses, but I just wanted to mention that also. So there's different methodologies that are used for usage and that, that can account for those discrepancies. Thank you, Ray. Yep. Thank you, Sean. Great presentation. Um, any comments or questions for Sean? No. All right, I'm going to move on to item 7C, which is the Old Colony 2023 Measures of Effectiveness report, and that would be Sean again. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. 
Mm -hmm. um, starting back in 2020, uh, Old Colony Planning Council um, started uh, re conducting yearly reports for uh, measures of effectiveness as part of our public participation plan. Um, it was a recommendation from the federal certification review uh, conducted back in 2019. And uh, on a yearly basis for for each calendar year, um, we conduct these reports, and this is going to be a presentation on the 2023 report. Uh, so measuring public participation, as I said, this was a, a recommendation from the 2019 certification review conducted by our federal partners at Federal Transit and Federal Highway. Uh, the first uh, measures of effectiveness report was completed for calendar year 2020. Um, the reason that we have this report is to analyze our public outreach measures um, and to determine its effectiveness. Uh, and by tracking our public engagements, we can determine if its efforts are delivering the desired results or if there are any changes that we can make um, to increase our engagements and our public participation. Um, so the the five measures of effectiveness that we have, uh, first and foremost is meeting attendance. So such as meetings uh, as the JTC or the MPO meetings, um, the number of limited English proficiency or Title VI protected class encounters, uh, the number of documents translated into the the four uh, limited English proficiency safe harbor clause languages, uh, which for our region are, are Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Haitian Creole, and French Creole. Uh, the number of direct engagements with outside organizations, such as our communities, uh, MassDOT, um, any, any other stakeholder for our region, as well as lastly, the number of correspondence that we put out, such as our social media, direct mailings, email, etc. Um, so for our direct engagements, uh, here's a five-year analysis of our engagements. Uh, 2023, we had the highest um, in the previous five years. Um, you know, some of our recurring engagements, as I said, are the MPO and the JTC meetings that we have, as well as the monthly uh, OCPC council meetings. Some of our other direct engagements that we have with the public um, are long range transportation plan public outreach, which we had a lot of uh, in 2023. Um, our road safety audits that we host, uh, corridor studies like the Route 139 that Gochang presented on earlier, um, our annual bike with bat day that we hold during uh, bike month. Um, and then as well as our OCPC bicycle and pedestrian uh, advisory committee meetings. And then here's a look at our MPO meeting attendance. Um, 2023, we yielded the highest MPO uh, attendance over the previous five years. Um, we had 11 meetings in 2023, uh, which was two more than the five-year average during this stretch. Uh, the average attendance for each meeting was 26 people, which is two more than the five-year average. Um, all of our meetings have been virtual since February of 2020, with the exception of the June 2021 meeting uh, in what, at which the signatories uh, were present in person at the, OC, at the Old Colony Planning Council office. Uh, next is the JTC meeting. 2023 had the second highest attendance over the last five years. Uh, we had 11 meetings in 2023, which was one more than the five-year average. Uh, the average attendance was 28 people per meeting, which was one less than the five-year average, um, and all JTC meetings have been held virtual since the March 2020 meeting, uh, shortly before the beginning of the pandemic. Um, overall engagement uh, includes both OCPC hosted as well as uh, outside engagements that OCPC attended, um, such as our certification review that we have once every four years. Um, transportation staff also attend the Massachusetts Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee meetings, um, the BAT, BAT Advisory Board meetings, which are held, I believe, every three to four months. Uh, OCPC also attends MassDOT TIP Project Public Design hearings. Uh, in 2023, in the springtime, uh, we had uh, hosted BAT Title VI public outreach for their updated triennial plan. Um, you know, also uh, attended select board meetings in our communities, as well as the Earth Day event held at Bridgewater State University. Um, starting in 2020, OCPC began its email newsletter. Um, some of our recipients include communities, partner organizations, as well as stakeholders. During calendar year 2023, we added 186 recipients, uh, bringing the, the total to 1,134. 
uh, total newsletters sent was 31,077, uh, which can be calculated by the number of recipients multiplied by the number of newsletters sent out. Uh, the month of November had the most newsletters with uh, 4,361, and December had the most uh, opened and read newsletters at 1,863. Um, our four social media pages that we uh, have for OCPC are Facebook, first and foremost. We had 251 posts with over 32,000 impressions, which consist of likes, comments, reactions, and shares. Um, our X slash Twitter account, we had 178 posts um, in 2023 with almost 22,000 impressions, which consists of views, likes, and reposts. Um, we brought back our Instagram account uh, for the first time in a handful of years. We had 123 posts with almost 2,500 impressions, uh, which is the number of times a post or story was viewed. And then our YouTube channel, we had 58 videos posted with a sum of 341 views. Um, some of the uh, recent features on our website, uh, first and foremost, is an accessibility toolbar. Uh, for anybody who may have any visual impairments, you can um, use the toolbar to change your text size or the contrast, make the font readable, uh, use your keyboard nav navigation, as well as disable animations. Um, and we also have a online public comment submission portal where you can both view the reports that are out for public review and you can also submit comments right on the same web page. Um, and while we did not have any engagements with any uh, limited English proficiency populations, uh, this is the survey for the Route 18 corridor study that we held last year in the Bridgewater in the communities of Bridgewater and East Bridgewater. Um, and as previously mentioned, it was translated in the four safe clause harbor languages for our region. Um, so we wanted to make sure to be inclusive to anybody who may not speak English and who needed it translated in a different language. Um, and one recommendation that uh, was given from the certification review that we had last year with our federal partners was to um, address outputs versus outcomes. Um, obviously, outputs you know can be the analysis of the meeting attendance um, as well as our social media pages. Um, but with uh, outcomes, we wanted to address uh, that as well. So with public comments, um, we have seen an increase in comments in recent years, as well as we've seen use of our online uh, comment portal since uh, having it become available. Um, and one item that was one outcome that was noticed in the uh, tip was that EJ Communities uh, tip project investment and percentage of projects by total investment increased. Uh, the project investment increased by 81 and a half percent from the 2019 to 2023 to the 2023 to 2027 tips. And in those same tips, the percent of projects by total investments in EJ communities increased by 14.8%. And then also looking at BATS uh, 2020 comprehensive regional transit plan, we noticed some uh, outcomes from that as well, uh, such as Sunday, you know, st Sunday service in the town of Stoughton, uh, bringing Sunday morning service into the city of Brockton and filling the gaps with microtransit. All three of those uh, needs identified in the CRTP uh, have been implemented. And then coordination needs and requests, uh, the use of automatic automated passenger counter and automatic vehicle locator technology, as well as expanding performance data availability um, have also been implemented since the 2020 CRTP. Um, and then in conclusion, uh, we saw a, an increase in direct engagement by 43%, as well as MPO attendance by 30%, and slight decreases of only 4% in overall engagement and JTC attendance over the from 2022 to 2023. Um, there were fewer, fewer total newsletters sent out than in 2022. Um, part of that can be contributed to um, fewer added recipients in 2023 than 2022. Um, and during 2023, we saw a dramatic increase in uh, returning to in-person engagements. Um, and throughout calendar year 2023, we had 18 in-person engagements um, attended by OCPC staff. And uh, we will continue our efforts and recommendations to increase our public participation uh, in the coming years. And uh, that is my report. Does anybody have any questions or comments? I wanted to say 
great presentation. The numbers were impressive um, on reaching, you know, the communities, you know, either via newsletters or just people using, you know, your different forms of um, communication via the computer. Um, interesting, people are really uh, using your services. So that's great. So people are understanding how to use them. And yes, ab ab absolutely. Yeah, they and, really, um, yeah. And for anybody who is interested, um, I put in the the chat for this meeting the link um, to the OCPC website for both the commuter origin study report uh -huh. as well as the uh, the measures of effectiveness report um, that I just presented on for anybody who uh, would like to review it. Great, um, great tools for all of us. Thanks again. Um, anyone have Thank any you. comments or questions for Sean? All right, hearing none. I'm going to move on to. Uh, item eight, which is other business, and that's community local technical assistance studies, and that would be Bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so I just had a few updates with the LTA program. Uh, we recently completed three um, studies in the region, and we have a couple requests for a couple of new ones. So going through the completed ones uh, in Kingston, we uh, <clears throat> we updated a road safety audit that we did for Landing Road last year. Um, that was to uh, get updated uh, traffic data during peak um, peak seasonal conditions, and as and also look at um, data um, on roadways and adjoining Duxbury, the southern portion of that town. Um, looking at how potential changes in Kingston and the Landing Road area could affect traffic in South Duxbury. So we we have released. Uh, an updated road safety audit report with addendum uh, for that, and that project is now complete. In Plimpton, we've completed a uh, road safety audit for Palmer Road and Center Street. That's Route 58 and Center Street. Um, and that so that is complete. And in Plymouth, we completed um, four micro traffic studies at four intersections in town, uh, looking at level of service and traffic single warrant analysis at those four locations and that has since been completed and distributed to the town. For new requests, we have um, one in the town of Avon. Uh, we're going to be doing a road safety audit on on Main Street with Route 28 uh, between High Street and West Main Street. Uh, that's um, So they'll, they'll have a uh, focus on uh, pedestrian safety in particular. Um, and this will also feed into um, a larger corridor study that we're doing in FY, FFY 2025. But uh, the this road safety audit will be a standalone report that we do uh, this fall. And that's, uh, as I said, that's scheduled to start this fall. And, um, and finally, in Halifax, we have a uh, request to look at speed zoning on Route 106 in their town's uh, business district over the over the years, the business district has kind of expanded. Uh, and as such, we're going to look at the possibility of um, updating speed zoning to reflect that expansion in the, in the uh, business district. And that covers my report for LTA. Thank you, Bill. Anyone have any questions for Bill or comments? Alrighty, hearing none, I'm gonna move on to 8B, which is staff reviews on ENFs, ERIs, and NPCs. And that would be Kyle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome. Um, some new projects and updates on uh, projects we've seen prior. Um, first is the South Weymouth Naval Air Station redevelopment project. Abington, Rockland, Weymouth. Um, they've submitted uh, their supplemental draft environmental impact report. Next, for the town of West Bridgewater, Crescent View Farm Residential Subdivision. Um, this project involves construction of three paved subdivision roadways and associated clearing and grading, utilities and stormwater management features on property located off Crescent Street and Old Crescent Street. And the proposed subdivision roadways will provide access to 29 proposed housing lots. Next is in Plymouth, 16 Town Wharf, and they've also submitted a single environmental impact report. 
uh, one certificate uh, for Bridgewater proposed mixed use development. And this certificate states that the project requires an environmental impact report. And then finally, some public notices. First for Pembroke, notice of request for a site examination. And this is in regards to expanding a public water supply source to withdraw up to approximately 1 to 1.14 million gallons per day of water from the groundwater of the Taunton River Basin in Pembroke. Next, the Town of Easton, notice of application and issuance of a draft groundwater discharge permit. And this is in regards to Quisit Commons and the discharge of 150,000 gallons per day of sanitary wastewater. Town of Duxbury, notice of intent to initiate an ecological restoration project. And this is in regards to the Temple Street Dam Removal Project. And that is it. Thank you, Kyle, very much. Any questions for Kyle or comments? Okay, I'm gonna move on to item number 8C, which is regional concerns and local community transportation issues. And I open this up to anyone on the committee who has questions, comments, or issues. All righty, just... Uh, a huge thank you for the uh, Oconee Planning Council staff. All the presentations were were super today. Um, good initiatives and good information for all of us, you know, to bring back to our communities. As always, appreciate your expertise. Um, I'm going to move on to item nine. And could I have a motion uh, to adjourn? I'll make that motion. motion. Second. Second. All in favor, you can just wave. Thank you very much. Thanks for attending the meeting today. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Yep.